Welcome back uh, to the afternoon session of the doctoral consortium. So we're going to start with a tutorial by uh, Fei Fang, and then we're going to follow up with our next session of lightning talks and posters. And then after the coffee break, we'll have the wildlife conservation panel. So uh, enjoy the rest of the program. Great. So everyone, uh, welcome back. So I'm Fei Fang. Uh, I got my PhD from USC, so it's, for me it's great to be back and give this tutorial. And after getting my PhD, uh, my advisor, Melan Tambay, is not here. Okay, so I, I had to Harvard University for a postdoc, and uh, uh, I'm heading to Carnegie Mellon University as an assistant professor in the Institute for Software Research, starting from August 1st. So glad to be here. And uh, today, so, so my, in general, my research interest is in AI and multi-agent systems, and com particularly in computational game theory, and um, uh, with connections to optimization and machine learning. Um, and I'm also very interested in AI and social good, meaning that I'm interested in problems where uh, AI techniques can deliver uh, benefits to the society now or in the very near future. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about game theory for protecting natural resources. And um, for this one, let me check if I can use the, okay. Um, so since this is a tutorial, uh, let me start with the very basics. So game theory is a study of uh, strategic decision making. Although it's uh, the first discussion of game theory starts from a two-player game of cards, but it's not just about entertainment. And game theory has been already used in various topics, especially in economics, political science. And among game theory researchers, you will find uh, Nobel Prize winners, including mm, George Nash and George von Neumann and um, uh, von Stackerberg. So, and nowadays, uh, game theory has been used for many other domains. For example, there have been a lot of successful application of game theory in security domains, uh, from protecting airports, flights, to protecting road networks and uh, ports. Um, so how does this work? Uh, here is a very simple toy example. So assume that um, you have, uh, consider a very simple two-player game um, where the defender uh, where there are two targets, which can be seen as, let's say, two terminals at an airport. And the defender has very limited resources so that the, he can only protect one of the targets every day. Um, and at the same time, there is an adversary who can choose to attack one of the targets when, uh, after he observes what the defender is doing. So, mm, and this matrix here shows the payoff values for the two players. The green is for the defender and the red is for the attacker. So assume that the defender is protecting target one. When the attacker attacks target one, then the defender gets a reward of five while the attacker gets a penalty of three. And uh, in contrast, if the defender is protecting target two when the attacker t attacks target one, then the attacker would succeed. So the attacker gets a reward of four while the defender gets a penalty of five. And of course, uh, in this game, the two players are not moving simultaneously because the defender is, mm, needs to uh, send patrols to protect these targets every day, while the attacker can spend months uh, for surveillance. And then after observing what the defender is doing, he would choose what to attack. So if the defender is doing something that, is, that can be easily uh, exploited, uh, for example, if the defender goes to protect target one every Monday morning, then this can be easily Found, uh, found by the attacker, and the attacker would just attack the other target uh, on that at that specific time. So it is very important for the defender to randomize. And in particular, for this example, the optimal strategy for the defender is to protect target one with probability of 50%, uh, uh, 0.556, and protecting target two with probability 0.444. And in this particular case, uh, why is this the number? Because in this case, when the attacker chooses which target to attack, he will evaluate whether I should attack target one or target two. If I attack target one, then the reward for me would be, uh, as shown here, mm, would be 0 0.556 multiplied by the um, penalty, uh, which is three, uh, plus the, the probability that the defenders 
protecting target two, in which case the attacker would su succeed and get a reward of four. And in, and in the end, the expected utility for the attacker for attacking target one is just around uh, 0.11. And similarly, the calculation can be done if the attacker is attacking target two, and he will find that uh, the expected utility is pretty much the same. So in this case, it's like the expected utility for attacking any of the targets is like already minimized. Mm, so uh, of course, for this toy example, it's easy to find out this optimal strategy for the defender. However, in uh, the real world, the problems can be way more complicated. And that's why uh, researchers develop algorithms and approaches trying to solve them in the uh, in more complicated cases. For example, uh, when the targets are moving, uh, consider a ferry line system, uh, then uh, we designed, one of my previous work is to design uh, patrol routes for the escort boats of the US Coast Guard to protect uh, the ferry lines like the Staten Island Ferry. So you need to make sure that the patrol routes can be somewhat randomized and dynamic uh, so that it, it, it can be unpredictable for the attackers to plan attack. So uh, after introducing all these successes of game theory in uh, protecting infrastructures, uh, now we move on to uh, how can we use game theory uh, to protect natural resources. So um, it is an important and pressing problem. For example, uh, here we show, um, we show the location of the Murchison Forest National Park. And as you can see here, this is the home of all kinds of wildlife, uh, including elephants, giraffes, uh, and hippos. And, uh, um, and ho however, their lives are threatened by poachers, because the poachers may kind of place this kind of snails or traps on the ground trying to catch them. And, um, uh, and as another example, the population of tigers has been dropped uh, from, uh, has been dropped from around 60,000 to 3,200. Uh, within the last 100 years. So, and a major drive of the population drop of tigers can be seen as the poaching. Uh, so, uh, the conservation agencies would send out patrol, uh, would send out patrol teams into the conservation areas and trying to uh, protect, protect the wildlife from poaching. However, given the vast area of, uh, in need of protection, uh, the, uh, sec the, the conservation agencies only have a very limited number of patrollers or resources. And this, in this way, and in addition, um, the, the poachers may uh, observe what the patrollers are doing and trying to like, react or respond to their strategy. And that's where game theory can, mm, can jump in and provide this strategic thinking. And in addition to that, in this conservation, uh, wildlife conservation or other uh, natural resource protection areas, uh, there can be a, a lot of data can be uh, recorded, and there is an uh, opportunity for using machine learning based uh, algorithms. So, what are the key challenges of applying game theory for protecting natural resources? Uh, we, I present a few uh, challenges here. So, first of all, especially comparing to what we have already uh, done in protecting uh, infrastructure um, situations where researchers have done, like, have investigated for more than 10, ten years. So, in these domains, there, there could be frequent and repeated attacks. Uh, so it's like it's no longer a one-shot game. And in addition, the attackers in these domains are m way more complicated because they may be constrained in their surveillance and they may spend less effort in the planning and they can be boundly irrational. And uh, in this case, since we have a lot of real-world data, uh, uh, we, we can exploit the data to make better decisions. However, when we look into the data, we will find a lot of challenges with it because often the case, the data is sparse, incomplete, and there's a lot of uncertainty and noise. And, uh, not more Im and another very important aspect of this whole work is that um, we not only want to do something that is on the paper, we really want to bring this game theoretic approaches to the field. And that means uh, we need to handle uh, how we need to handle the uh, practical constraints and try to do, mm, run field tests to evaluate what we are doing, uh, whatever model that we are proposing. So uh, these are like based on this uh, wildlife protection, but of course similar challenges are there for protecting forest from illegal extraction or uh, protecting fisheries from overfishing. And there are other additional challenges, uh, including that we are we 
don't know much about the area and there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of the reward or penalty if we consider it as a game. And maybe we are considering a continuous space that we need to protect in, instead of protecting a few terminals at, at the airport. So um, t in today's talk, I will mainly focus on the area of wildlife protection, although many of the techniques can be also used for uh, protecting other types of natural resources. Um, and uh, I will introduce the framework of PAWS, Protection Assistant for Wildlife Security. So this PAWS is like a, uh, the name that we, we have for a software uh, that we uh, have designed. However, this framework, under this framework, uh, we have been there, there has been a lot of research topics that we have been, we have been uh, working on different aspects of uh, the problems of PAWS. So at a high level, PAWS takes into uh, account the past patrolling and poaching information as well as the local information of the protected area and then uh, runs an algorithm that incorporate, uh, uh, runs an algorithm to generate a set of patrol routes and then will send the the patrollers to follow these patrol routes and collect more poaching data, and which would again be fed into the whole algorithm to, gen to update the patrol routes and the strategy. So within this cause, uh, call algorithm, uh, we, uh, it, incorpor in, inter it incorporates learning, game, the game theoretic reasoning, and route planning. So uh, for the, and the whole pause framework has been uh, deployed in the field in multiple countries and we have uh, saved animals uh, from the field tests uh, as we can see from the field tests. So for the rest of the talk uh, I will uh, go through these three aspects of the core algorithm of PAWS including learning, game theoretic reasoning and route planning. So as I mentioned um, there are a lot of work in each of these aspects and what we have been doing is that we're trying to develop new algorithms, better algorithms in each of these two, uh, in each of these three modulars of PAWS. And uh, um, at the end of talk, we will provide a summary and introduce the next steps. So for the first part, we are going to talk about learning. So the first thing we need to consider is how do the poachers or the attackers behave in these domains? Um, so. For example, this is like this is a Queen Elizabeth National Park uh, in Uganda, and mm, assume that the hippos or some kind of wildlife distributed in this way in the whole park, and then uh, the defenders. Uh, the, then this colored map shows the defenders' coverage probability, meaning that how frequently they will go to protect each of these areas. So the reddish color means that they go there more often, while the greenish color means that they don't patrol it very often. Uh, or not at all. So if, assuming that the attacker is uh, perfectly rational, what he would do is that he would just compute the expected utility of attacking each of the targets as we uh, demonstrated at the very beginning for the toy example. And then they would choose uh, the one that was the highest expected utility to place this, their snails. That means what you will observe is that all the snails will be placed in one of the cells, which is the best for them. But clearly, th this is not the case. And the actual attacks can be distributed around uh, all the areas of the park. So now the question is, mm, how can we come up with a model that can explain how do they decide where to place these, these snails? So uh, we start from the very beginning, uh, the, the very basic um, boundary rational model of quantum response. This is a very famous model. So what it says is that there is error in individual's response. Uh, so instead of choosing the one with the highest, uh, with the highest expected utility, well, uh, a player can also choose the actions with a lower expected utility. However, they it's still more likely for them to select better choices than the worst choices. So. Uh, so this QJ, if we use QJ to represent the probability of choosing option J, then this, uh, then this probability is proportional to uh, e to the power of lambda multiplied by the attacker's expected utility of attacking target J, given the defender strategy being X. So um, more concretely, this lambda value here, you can think of it as a measure of how rational the, pl the player is. If lambda equals to zero, then you look at this formula, you will see that uh, the, uh, the 
the, the numerator is just one for every option j, and the denominator is n when n is the number of targets. So this becomes a uniform random uh, selection of, of targets to attack. However, if lambda is very high, then this is very close to a perfectly rational model because when the lambda is high, a very tiny difference in, in the expected utility of the, the attacker will, will be converted into a very high difference in the uh, probability of attack. So it's, uh, eventually, the probability of uh, attacking target attacking the target with the highest expected utility becomes one, while the probability of attacking other targets becomes zero. So, uh, uh, so uh, if we have data, we can clearly try to learn this value of lambda using maximum likelihood estimation. And from the uh, data collected uh, from human subject ex experiments, uh, the learned lambda has been proved to be around 0.76. However, uh, further investigation into the model, we found that it, it seems like people don't even compute the expected utility. So what they are going to do is that they will just only look at some of the features that are relevant in this domain. For example, um, the coverage probability of the defender and the reward or penalty if they attack a specific target. And they will have like a linear combination of all these features and that, that will be their subjective evaluation of how promising this target is. And they will, do a, choose, a prob they will choose a target to attack in a similar way that uh, is as described by the quantum response. So uh, this is so-called the subjective ut utility quantum response model. So it, again, it is like saying that uh, the tar each target will be attacked with some probability, and the probability can be described uh, as shown here. So, uh, however, this is like uh, this seems like we are not considering the case. We are not considering the repeated interaction in this domain. If we consider the inter repeated interaction in this domain, what would happen? So we designed. Um, an online game abstracting this scenario. So as a, you can see here, this is again some of the conservation areas and we show the hippos trying to say this is the animal de density distribution and we ask the human players to play the role of the poacher as you can see from the left, uh, lower left corner. So you, uh, the, as a poacher you can choose which a cell you want to place this now, and uh, the information on the right will show you what is the reward, what is the penalty, and what is the probability that you will get caught by the by the ranger. So, um, and the most important thing here is that it's not a single shot game. We will invite the same group of people to come back and play the game again and again and again. And we found something that is uh, very interesting. So. Uh, we found that if we only if we still use the strategies that we designed before, for example, the basic maximum strategy or the strategy that is designed against the subjective utility quantum response model, we do not get a very good performance, as indicated here uh, on the graph. So. Uh, the whole idea here is that we want to learn from the data, we want to update the strategy, and then we want to kind of deploy the strategy again and collect the data and update the strategy again. Mm, then, uh, but like even with this whole framework, this whole, the, the SUQR model doesn't work, or even the Bayesian version of the SUQR model doesn't work. So this is like a very extensive, uh, experiment, we run it for 35 weeks uh, with 40 human subjects, and we send out more than 10,000 emails uh, trying to kind of invite them back to play the game again. And so what are the key findings here? What we found here is that uh, whether or not they succeeded in the last round of the game matters in their decision making for the future. So for example, if you consider uh, the targets, if you put the targets in the space of animal density and coverage probability, then of course a target that is um, with high animal density and low coverage probability is most mm, preferred by the, by the uh, attackers or the poachers. And in addition to that, uh, you will see that what, uh, if in the last round of the game, uh, for some of the targets they attacked, uh, they succeeded, as indicated by the green stars, and the other for the other targets they failed. Then you will see that they will just boost the importance for the ones that uh, they succeeded. So they will uh, they will be more likely to attack the targets that are similar to the ones that they succeeded before. So uh, based on these uh, 
uh, observation, we designed a new model called uh, SHARP. And when tested against the human, subject, human subjects, we found that the SHARP algorithm uh, leads to a different strategy that uh, can be way better than the previous strategies that we tested. So, um, and, and w uh, another lesson learned from this sharp thing is that we found the adversaries are actually weighing the probabilities in a nonlinear way. So it's like if the coverage probability for, it, for a target is around 0.1, then you, you would imagine that the attacker should perceive it as 0.1. However, that's not the case when we try to fit the data. And when we fit the data, uh, we found out that uh, the probability uh, weighing function of the attacker is more like an S-shaped function, meaning that uh, when, the, uh, when the probability is uh, low or less than 0.5, the perceived uh, probability is even lower. Uh, while the, probability, uh, the actual probability is high th more than 0.5, the perceived probability is even higher. So this is like contra uh, contrary to the famous prospect theory, uh, which proposes that the probability weighing function should be inverse S-shaped. Um, but this is what we found from the uh, subjective experiment, human, human subjects experiments, and we are willing to investigate more uh, about how to like I explain all these in a more uh, uh, in, in a in other ways. So we have also bring this sharp uh, algorithm or the strategies to the field. So we uh, we. Uh, our team members go to m Indonesia and ask the rangers to play the role of the poachers because they do it every day. They, they patrol every day. They know the mm, po poachers way better than us. So we assume that their behavior uh, model can be more similar to what the poachers are really doing. And again, the sharp model uh, leads to way better results than the maximum strategies. So. Um, so that's kind of the first part of the, the, the talk where we talk about how to learn the attacker's behavior models. However, so far we are mainly talking about learning from uh, the human subject ex experiments or from the rangers. But it, fortunately in these domains we do have real world data. So can we just directly learn from the real world data and design some model that can explain the, the data well? So we got data from the Queen Elizabeth National Park uh, for uh, from 2003 to 2015. And this park uh, spans over 1,900 square kilometers. And uh, we got data about all the geographical, fe geographical features, for, uh, including the terrain feature, including the distance to the nearest town, where the bodies or the, the outposts. And we also got data about the ranger's coverage. And we know that um, where, do the po where do the patrollers found any sightings of poaching? any signs of poaching during their patrols. And with all these data, we want to learn directly how do the poachers behave. However, uh, we found, again, a lot of challenges, as we indicated at, at the beginning of the talk. The first challenge is the missing poaching data. So uh, because that we have very limited patrol resources, we cannot cover the whole park in every time uh, we go for patrols. And the animals cannot report that they are being poached. So they have this like silent victim problem. And in addition to that, uh, even if the patrollers go to somewhere uh, and didn't find anything, it doesn't mean that there is no poaching at all because it, it is possible that the, the snails are well hidden and are not found, are not found by the patrollers. So uh, these, this missing poaching data leads to several consequences. First of all, there's uncertainty in the negative labels we get in the data. And second, there's a huge imbalance, a class imbalance. Actually, uh, if you look at the data entries directly, we got m around 90% of the data uh, have negative labels. Only 10% of the cells are being uh, attacked in a particular year. So if you directly run the standard machine learning algorithm, then it clearly it would just uh, output negative for everything, and it's not informative at all. So, um, so uh, to capture this whole, uh, th these challenges, um, uh, uh, 
there has been a model called Capture that is being proposed, which is a two-layer model. What it says is that, uh, first of all, we need to reason about what is the probability of attack. And in addition to this, we need to reason about what is the detection probability by the rangers. So it's like the, it, the, the two things are separate, whether or not the poachers attacked or whether or not the uh, patrollers can observe anything. So in the first layer, uh, it's more about the poachers' decision making. Of course, they would take into account all the potential features, including the patrol coverage, including the animal density, and all the distances and, the, uh, and other features. And after they, if conditioned on that the attackers have placed a snail in a particular location, we need to move to the detection probability layer, saying that given that, what is the probability that a patroller can observe anything if he patrolled that area? And again, this detection probability is also affected by all these domain features. Um, or many of these domain features. So with this model, uh, the, 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 with this whole uh, two-layered model, Capture is able to um, predict, uh, least, uh, Capture is able to predict where uh, are, where can people find, where can the patrollers find the snails, and it leads to a higher AOC compared to the standard machine learning algorithms. And the map on the right shows uh, the predictions of the, of, of capture, and it is not well shown here. Actually, um, capture just put more defender resources on both the green and red areas. So, however, there are several limitations of this model. First of all, um, when there is limited data, this the where do the capture predict uh, the attacks is very unstable. Sometimes it can just predict. Uh, there are attacks everywhere while not changing too much about the final result, meaning that when you look at the, the, where the, the patrollers will find the snails, it's still uh, pretty reasonable. While if you on only look at the attack layer, meaning where do the poachers place the snails, it's just uh, a positive sign everywhere. And in addition to that, uh, this learning, uh, to learn this model, to learn the parameters in this model, it can take a long time. And we, based on, the, uh, to address these limitations, we tried all kinds of variations. We tried to use a simpler observation layer, or we tried to use previous coverage instead of the current coverage uh, to be one of the features being used. And we tried to e exponentially penalize the attractiveness of in accessible areas, like uh, the areas with very high, uh, like high grass. And however, uh, these variations does not lead to any improvement. And after trying all these things, uh, we found something that is very surprising. We found that a simple decision tree based model can outperform all these previous mentioned models. So um, in this de decision tree based model, we start with a decision tree that, is, uh, that has spatial awareness. So we call it boost it. And what it does is that it first learns a decision tree in a normal way, and then it, compute, uh, it would predict um, where, where it thinks that there will be uh, attacks. And then based on these predictions, we compute a new feature, meaning that mm, how many of your neighbors has been predicted to have attacks. And if many of your neighbors have been predicted to, be, to have attacks, then um, it is highly possible that in this particular cell also have attacks because it is well known that there has been poaching hotspots in this domain of poaching, meaning that there will be like a part of the area that is like very popular among the, uh, for the poachers. So basically, for example, the one in the middle, you can see that three out of four of its four neighbors has been predicted to have attacks. So in this case, uh, it is highly possible that this target will be we also have uh, attacks in the future. So, so we kind of compute this additional feature of uh, hotspot proximity and then relearn a new decision tree. And this whole process can be repeated until a stopping condition is reached. And in addition to this spatial aware decision tree model, we also combine it with other, other types of decision tree models to make it a decision tree, a decision tree ensemble and uh, use majority voting to decide uh, what is the final label that uh, should be presented for each of the targets. And after the extensive empirical evaluation, we found that this specific um, decision tree ensemble that consists of five different decision trees uh, leads to uh, the best performance. And uh, it 
in addition to the, the uh, improvement in the performance, this decision tree based model also have a faster runtime and a better interpretability compared to previous uh, models like Capture. And we tested on the trained data sets from 2003 to 2014 and uh, with tested data set to be the um, data from 2015. And what we found here is that uh, our model leads to, uh, leads to a slightly lower recall, uh, however, uh, get a much higher precision. So if you, uh, given that we are considering this, uh, this data with mm, uncertainties in the negative labels, so we deployed, so we use this so-called the LNL score, which is uh, designed spe specifically for positive and unlabeled learning, and we found that uh, our, our model uh, leads to a much higher LNL score compared to the uh, all other models uh, that we have tested. So in addition to this, we started deploying our predictions to the field. So what we do is we, cho uh, we chose two, uh, two patrol areas that are not frequently patrolled before by the rangers, and the model predict it to be a hotspot. So mm, during this one month field test, uh, the poachers uh, the, the patrollers have found nine, uh, a lot of signs of trespassing, and they also found one, unfortunately, they also found one poached elephant. And uh, in addition to that, they found a bunch of snails, including one active snail, uh, one cache of 10 antelope snails, and one row, row of elephant snails. So all these uh, findings of the snails are very important because it means that we, can, we have potentially saved animals before they are getting poached. And uh, if we check the snaring hit rate, it actually uh, outperforms 91% 90, of previous months of patrols. And our hit rate is actually uh, 3, while the historical base hit rate is around 0.73. So, uh, and we're, the, the whole uh, trial of, of pr making better predictions or understanding what, how the poachers are behaving uh, did not end there. So we move on to this hybrid spatial temporal model because the decision tree model, as you can see here uh, previously, it is mainly only considered the spatial correlations, but not much about the temporal correlations. So what we do here is that uh, we combine the decision tree model and the Markov random fields model. Uh, and we are aware that the Markov random fields model uh, Needs to needs a lot of data to get a pretty good uh, learned parameters. So we will uh, adaptively select which model to use for each part of the, uh, uh, the cons conservation area. If that's an area that we got a lot of data previously, then we will apply the Markov random fields. Otherwise, we just use the decision tree. And by combining these two models, uh, we get. Uh, a new hybrid model, and we uh, uh, launched a much longer uh, field test that lasts for eight months in the field, and trying to answer the question, can this hybrid model differentiate between the areas of high and low poaching activity? And uh, what we are defining it is that we consider, uh, so each dot here, each blot, blue dot here represent a one kilometer by one kilometer area. So we look at a three by three kilometer areas and we ask the prediction model to make predictions of whether or not th there should be poaching activities. If more than 50% of the nodes or tar cells has been predicted to, be, to have poaching activity, then we would say that this is a high group. Otherwise, it is a low group. And, uh, in collaboration with Wildlife Conservation Society and the Uganda Wildlife Authority, we have been able to test this whole model. Uh, and what we do is we choose 27 uh, three by three areas, uh, and with five of them mm, being high group and 22 of them being low group. And mm, of course, the membership of the of the of these. Um, areas are hidden from the rangers, and we ask the rangers to patrol these areas uh, during these eight months. And we chose this, these uh, areas specifically because we need to uh, satisfy a, a set of constraints. For example, we don't want to send the patrollers to area, areas that are too far away from the ranger post, and we don't want to send them to the areas that have been patrolled too, too frequently or too infrequently. And the ones that are highlighted here are the high groups, other ones are the low groups. So uh, during these 
the, during this controlled field test, uh, most of the efforts are actually spent on the low groups, one because there are, uh, b mainly because there are um, many more targets, uh, many more areas in the low group. However, uh, when you check the snaring activity that have been observed by the patrollers, you will see that the high group got much more uh, observations. And if you compute the catchment unit effort, which is a standard way of capture uh, how, much, how many snails you found per kilometer of walking, you will see that uh, the result is very significant that high group leads to much higher catch per unit effort. So, and the result is uh, statistical uh, significant. And what, we ha what do we learn from both these uh, field tests? So the first field test demonstrated the potential of using predictive analytics in the field. And the second eight months field test uh, is actually a first of its kind of test of using, of uh, testing a machine learning based model for this whole domain for like uh, this large scale real world deployment. And it, during these tests, uh, the patrollers have approximately patrolled 452 kilometers, and the whole test demonstrated the selectiveness of the model's prediction with respect uh, to whether there is high or low poaching activities. And uh, we, we are very proud that uh, with this mm, field test, we have potentially saved more animals uh, than previous patrols. And uh, however, as we said, the whole thing here is just to learn how the poachers behave, and we only send people, we only send patrollers to areas that we predict to have high or low poaching activities. But we don't want to end there because we know that the poachers may react or respond to what the defender is doing, what the patroller is doing. So th then it is important to have game, theor game theoretical reasoning in this whole sense. So uh, we, I've mentioned that. Previously, in security game literature, there has been a lot of work and models and algorithms developed for infrastructure security domains like protecting terminal, uh, airport terminals. So what are the challenges here specifically for uh, protecting wildlife or other uh, natural resources? The first challenge is how to handle the uncertainty. So to handle uncertainty, uh, Uncertainty is important because in this wildlife conservation domains, it is highly possible that you don't really know what is the payoff structure uh, of the domain. For example, you, you only get a very rough estimate of the animal de uh, density distribution uh, in the area. So uh, in this case, what can we do? So uh, the, one of the mm, concept, uh, solution concept that, that has been introduced is this behavioral minimax regret. Basically, it says that, well, if, the, um, if I know I'm aware of the payoff instance, then I can compute the optimal defender strategy, and which will lead to the optimal defender's utility in this way. However, I know that there can be some uncertainties in the payoff instance. What if the payoff is, is different? Then if the payoff is with instance two, then I should have designed a different defender strategy leading to a different uh, optimal utility. So if, we, if I list, list out all the possible payoff instances in this uncertain, uh, uncertain domain, I can compute all the different optimal strategies corresponding to these payoff instances, and I can compute the optimal utility for each of these payoff instances. Uh, since I don't know which payoff instance I'm facing, then the goal for me is to try to find out a defender strategy so that uh, I can get a reasonable defender utility under each of these cases, meaning that reasonable, meaning that the difference between the utility I get and the optimal utility for that specific payoff instance is not too high. So with this concept, we designed uh, the it can be uh, translated into solving an optimization problem where, what we, so, uh, where we are saying that we're trying to minimize the regret one has uh, when using a defender strategy X, while the regret is basically like the utility difference between using my strategy X and using the optimal strategy that is designed specifically for that payoff instance. And however, we know that uh, the poachers are boundly rational, so we assume that the attackers uh, may follow the subjective, subjective utility quantum response model. And another challenge here is that we will 
have infinite number of uh, constraints because although we mentioned in the previous slide looking like we have only finite number of payoff instances, but in practice it could be the case that we only know a range of the payoff values, meaning that we are faced with infinite number of payoff instances. So what we do is uh, we can use this so-called incremental payoff generation. Basically, we start with only a few payoff instances and then we gradually uh, and we gradually find out what is the next payoff instance that we should be, uh, that should be added into this whole optimization problem uh, to be considered, and un until it just uh, there's no more payoff instances that needs to be considered in the in the, this whole optimization problem. So, uh, in addition to handle uncertainty, another key aspect in uh, of game theoretic reasoning in wildlife conservation domain is to handle the re repeated interaction. So that's where we introduce this so-called green security game model. Uh, well, this game mo in this game model, instead of considering like a simple game, we are considering a multi-stage game. So let me introduce this game along this timeline. So assume this is a conservation area that is divided into nine regions, and the colors in this uh, in the cells represent the coverage probability. The more greenish it is, the, the higher the coverage probability is. And given this defender strategy, the patrollers will sample a patrol route out of it, and at the same time, the poachers will choose which cell they want to place the snouts, uh, as indicated by the red cross in the middle. Uh, so the, red, uh, the green line is the patroller's route, and the red cross is the poacher's selection of target. And the, this, uh, and on the next day, the patroller will choose a different patrol route, and the poacher may still again place the snails uh, on the ground. And this can continue for weeks or months, and then after some time, the defender may choose to change his strategy. So he may just change to a new strategy, and the patrollers will start uh, uh, sample a patrol route out of it again, while the poachers uh, will kind of also uh, place snails on the ground again. So. Here is the first um, key point of this new model. That is, it is a multi-stage game. In each stage, the defender can choose a different mixed strategy. And the second key point of this new model is that the attacker may have delayed observation. So remember that the defender strategy is actually hidden from the poachers. And what the poachers can observe is, first of all, whether their snails has been confiscated by the patroller, and second, they may communicate with each other about whether their snails has been confiscated. They can even talk to the local villagers to understand where do the patrollers uh, go re more often recently. However, all this communication of information leads to a delay in their understanding of the defender strategy. So for example, um, when the defender switches from one strategy to the other, the poacher's understanding may still uh, have uh, uh, get lagged, and they may still believe that they're using the old strategy and choose where to place the snails based on their outdated understanding. So uh, based on this uh, delayed observation, the defender can mm, potentially exploit this and try to deceive the De deceive the poachers in an optimal way. For example, the defender can send patrollers to this area more often de de deliberately at the very beginning, and then he knows that after some time, this kind of defender strategy ha will be observed by the defender, uh, by the poacher, and once the poachers realize that this is going to be the defender strategy and trying to respond to it, the defender can send more patrollers to other areas, uh, which uh, in turn would lead uh, to a higher capture rate of, for the defender. So um, more formally, uh, this, this, this green security game model is a T-stage game with N targets and L attackers, and we can, the defender can choose a defender mixed strategy in each stage, and we have an attacker who has a bounded memory and a set of coefficients in uh, describing how, in, how much they, uh, they value each round of the uh, how much they value the defender strategy in the history. So the, essentially, mm, the attacker is responding to a belief that is a linear combination of the defender strategies in the recent rounds, and the attacker responds to this belief in a boundedly rational way uh, by uh, d using the subjective utility quantum response model. So uh, given this model, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, do the planning and come up with uh, a sequence of 
defend the strategies to be used across multiple stages. And here I just show the simulation results, uh, which, uh, which we can see that when we use the planning uh, algorithms indicated by the red bar and yellow bar, meaning that the defender is trying to uh, deceive, the de deceive the attackers by using uh, plan ahead or cyclic strategies, it actually leads to higher defender's expect utility compared to the standard Stackerberg equilibrium. And for one of the planning algorithms, we can also provide theoretical uh, uh, solution quality bound for it. And uh, that's kind of the part of the game theoretical reasoning. However, in the end, remember that we need to provide patrol rules for the rangers to follow. So even the game theoretical reasoning is not the end of the story. And uh, once we move to the route planning, we will find out that there are more practical constraints that we need to consider. For example, uh, this is one site that we want to deploy our a game theoretic approach. And as you can see here, the elevation change is not neglectable. So the uh, green triangle there is a the location of the base camp. So let's say that our game theoretic algorithm has already provided us some mixed strategy for the defender. And you can sample a patrol route from this strategy. Uh, and it may look fine on the 2D map, but if you check it on the 3D map, it is terrible and it is important. Uh, it is impossible for the patroller to follow. So to understand how patrol really works, we went to Malaysia and did an eight hour patrol um, in April 2015 to understand how patrolling really works. And this, is, this photo is taken at the beginning of the patrol and this is like after our eight hours of walking in the jungle. <laughs> so really, patrolling is not easy. And what we have learned from this whole first-hand experience is that the terrain is very important and the terrain features such as ridge lines and streams are usually easier for people to walk along, even if you, your pants will get wet. So um, based on this, we kind of changed our design of the uh, whole mm, patrol strategy from a purely grid-based thinking to a more route-based thinking. So instead of just dividing the whole area into, let's say, one kilometer by one kilometer uh, cells, we now consider the more detailed or fine-grained uh, terrain features like the ridge lines, because these terrain features are the ones that have a smooth uh, elevation change. And that means there will be a higher animal traffic. And it is, it is easier for the patrollers to uh, move along as well. So we use a hierarchy hierarchical modeling approach um, to focus on the terrain features and build a virtual street map. So uh, let's say how we do it. This is a contour map. The, the points along the same line indicates that they have the same elevation. And the, uh, the dot with the green triangle is the base camp, which is the lowest elevation point, uh, at least for this instance. So what we do is we first divide it into one kilometer by one kilometer regions. And then we try to identify uh, ridge lines and the streams uh, from, this, uh, from this contour map. Uh, and then we try to build a virtual street map that can connect all these ridge lines and streams together. And based on this street map, we can plan our patrol route. And we are m now more confident that it is much easier for the patrollers to follow such a route. So, However, we also need to consider the scheduling constraints. Because for example, um, let's say if this here we know the, tri the green triangle is the location of the base camp, then you can imagine that no matter how you change your patrol route, the coverage probability of the cell that uh, the base camp is in should always be one, because you always start from the base camp and go back to the base camp. So you cannot arbitrarily uh, find a mixed strategy and say that this is a strategy that you, you need to use. We need to consider all these practical scheduling constraints. So to handle this, what we do is we first call the game, the game theory algorithm and ask it to generate a mixed strategy C. And then we check if it can be implemented by a, a, a practical patrol routes, meaning that uh, if this mixed strategy can be uh, realized by a probability distribution over a, m a bunch of concrete patrol routes. If yes, then we are happy, we're done. Otherwise, we will find out a linear constraint that should be satisfied by the mixed strategy, but hasn't been satisfied. For example, the, the coverage 
probability for the base camp should be no less than 1. This could be a linear constraint. And we feed this constraint back to the game theory algorithm and ask it to uh, generate a new mixed strategy with this linear constraint. And we continue doing this until we finally found some uh, reasonable solution. So with this uh, framework, we in the end, we are able to uh, find a virtual street map and design reasonable patrol routes, uh, patrol strategies uh, on it. And now, as we can see here, that the patrol routes in this case is much more compatible with the terrain. And uh, due to these work, um, this whole framework was able to uh, be deployed in the real world, uh, and this this. Deployment is in collaboration with Panthera and Rimba, uh, two NGO uh, wildlife conservation agencies. So uh, it has been deployed in Malaysia since July 2015, and these photos are taken during the real world patrols. Um, so let's look at the, how the patrol routes actually look like. Before we have this, be, before we move to the route based thinking, we're using this grid based thinking, and the orange route is what our algorithm provides to the rangers. And uh, uh, the black route is what they actually take. As you can see here, they cannot follow what we are suggesting them to do. And it, it, it is even impossible for them to come back to the base camp at the end of the patrol. And after that, uh, we move to the route-based thinking. We provide more detailed uh, patrol routes. And it's much easier for people, for the rangers to follow. Um, so during these patrols, uh, the rangers do find uh, a various animal signs and human activity signs. And if you compute the number of activi human activity signs or animal signs being found per kilometer of patrol, you will see that uh, the pause uh, patrols are not leading them to somewhere that no one cares. So actually, if we compare to previous patrols, where the main goal for those set of patrols is for tiger surveillance, not for uh, deterring the poaching activities, but still, uh, it can be viewed as a reference point, And we can see that the pause patrols has led to a high number of uh, animal, activity, animal signs and human activity signs being found. And in addition to that, pause patrols has guided the rangers to, area, to some areas that they have never been patrolled, bef they have never patrolled before. And those areas have also led to a high human activity sign and animal sign being found. So of course, uh, we mentioned that the whole learning algorithms are evolving. The game theoretical part is also evolving. And not all of them, not all of the latest models have been incorporated in the, in the current, pause, uh, fr uh, current pause version of pause application. So uh, uh, the first next step that we are trying to do is we, we will keep improving each part of these three uh, components of pause and trying to incorporate them all into the latest uh, pause application. And uh, to summarize, pause just takes into account past patrolling and poaching information as well as the protected area information and trying to learn the behavior model of the poachers based on which we can do game theoretic reasoning. And in addition, we will need to plan concrete routes for the rangers. Uh, and then uh, the, as the rangers execute the patrol routes, more data will be collected and fed back into the pause algorithm. So. Uh, we have using this wildlife protection as an example case throughout the talk. However, game theory is not only used for wildlife protection. It can be used for other cases like protecting forest resources or protect the fisheries. And we've also done uh, work for those cases as well. For example, for forest protection, uh, one of the work that we have done is to see how should we allocate patrol resources to um, prevent, to reduce uh, to minimize the trespass distance from of the villagers who are living uh, at the perimeter of a circular shaped forest. Um, because these villagers will go towards the center of the vi uh, towards the center of the forest and trying to extract fuel wood or other kind of non-timber uh, uh, fuel uh, products from the forest. And what we found here is that the optimal patrol strategy is to actually leave a buffer zone at the perimeter of the whole forest area and then start patrolling heavily uh, to deter uh, the to deter the uh, villagers from coming from going further into the forest. And at the core of the forest, there's no need to do any patrol at all because uh, you've already patrolled enough in the, this donut-shaped band that no one would go across this donut-shaped band at all. So, and 
in another piece of work that is more recent work, uh, we are considering how to protect the valuable trees in the forest. For example, if you can, uh, if the green dots in this in this Im image shows where the valuable trees are, and the the again the uh, the attackers are uh, starting from the perimeter of the of the forest and trying to go towards the center of the forest. How should we uh, send the patrollers, as indicated by the blue dots and their protection range uh, in a circle? How should we send these patrollers to different areas to protect these valuable trees? We're trying to use uh, deep learning. Uh, we're trying to uh, use uh, neural networks to find out the best strategies for the players. And this is an ongoing work that we have just uh, submitted to a, uh, we have just accepted to a workshop and we are continuing uh, refining the model and the whole approach. And in addition to forest, we are also con considering how to protect fisheries from overfishing. And in this case, again, uncertainty is a big problem. And we have introduced this minimum re uh, behavioral minimax regret previous Pre, uh, in the previous part of the talk. And you may also consider other types of uh, notions of solution concepts. For example, if we just want to um, optimize against the worst case scenario, what kind of strategy should we, uh, should we use? So all this work has been done, but there are a lot more open to be explored. And for example, uh, we now know that there are a lot of uh, equipments that can collect the data. In addition to human patrols, we may have UAVs, we may have sensors or camera traps, uh, uh, everything that can collect the data. Then how can we m make best use of these data and combine them with the human patrols to protect, uh, to provide better strategies uh, altogether? That's kind of the, one of the main uh, lines of research that I want to pursue uh, in the next few years. And uh, in general, what we have seen here is that we can use game theory and machine learning to provide uh, strategies that can solve sustainable, su sustainability challenges and also security challenges. And uh, I think in this domain, there's a whole lot more to do. And uh, I also want to mention at the end of the talk that uh, I have uh, built this website of AI and social good uh, on which I have this uh, site of research expedition where I w uh, we want to promote research projects that are related to AI and social good and uh, another page of social good challenges trying to like call for the real challenges that are in need of AI. So if you are n aware of any uh, social good challenges or if you know that there are some good research projects that should be included, just let me know uh, or submit uh, feedback in the, on the website directly. So thank you all. and. Any questions?